The enormous strength of Oceanus with his deep running waters, Oceanus from whom all rivers are, and the entire sea, and all springs, and all deep wells have their water of him, Homer, Iliad. Oceanus is the oldest of the titans, the precursors to the Olympian gods, and sons and daughters of Gia and Oranos. Behind Kronos and Rhea, Oceanus is easily the most important and featured titan within Greek mythology. Not only is Oceanus personally important, but his sons and daughters are equally, and perhaps even more, important. Oceanus is married to his sister, the titaness Theus. Together, the two are typically seen as the second rulers of the seas and oceans of the world, after Pontus, the primordial god of water. But what did Oceanus and Tithus do to deserve mention alongside Kronos and Rhea as the most important titans? Did Oceanus support his brother, Kronos, as king? And what happened to Oceanus when the Olympians seized power in the universe? Let's talk about it. Before we get any further into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out and it motivates me to make more content. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. While we are told that Oceanus is the oldest of the Titans, we are not quite sure how much older he was than his various siblings. We don't know anything about how Oceanus grew up, nor how he received his domains. We do know that he would marry his sister, Tithus. Tithus is typically seen as the second youngest Titan, with only Kronos being younger. Together, the two represented the water deities within the Titans. Oceanus in particular is strongly associated with water, and Tithus seems to follow her husband's lead. This is an important distinction to make in our study of the Titans. We are typically only given vague illusions as to what most Titans represented or held domains over. For instance, of the twelve firstborn Titans, we know for a fact the domains of only seven. The rest we are left to piece together based on what their names meant and their respective spouses or children. This is the case with Tethys. We are never told in particular what she held domains over. We are left to assume it was some aspect of the sea or water, or of some sort, because she is married to Oceanus, who is obviously associated with water in our sources. So then what was Oceanus actually associated with? Oceanus is associated with the river of the same name, the river Oceanus. This river surrounds the flat disk of the earth, and in some sources, all of creation. It is from this river that all of earth's fresh water comes from, be it the smallest streams to the largest rivers. It was also in the river Oceanus where the sun, moon, and the stars would all rise and set, with the celestial bodies being guided along the river by whichever deity was in control of the bodies at the time. There has been some speculation that this even means that Oceanus had some sort of control over the flow of time itself but I would imagine his brother Kronos would have something to say about that. Hesiod tells us that beyond the river, a quote, dark and misty shore, exists where the edge of the sky rests on the edge of the earth, and the great walls of Tartarus rise from below to come into contact with the earth. Thus, we end up with a sort of egg shape, with the earth serving as the dividing line between the realms of the gods and the realms of the dead and the imprisoned. Of course, since the deity Oceanus represents the source of all fresh water on Earth, it makes sense that his children would represent those sources of fresh water upon the earthly plane. We are told that Oceanus and Tethys have two sets of children. The first are the Potomi, or river gods. These are innumerable, with most sources agreeing, or at least implying, that every single river and stream of Earth has a corresponding river god. Hesiod tells us the name of some of the most important. I want to throw in a, just a quick note here that my pronunciation of all these names is probably going to be terrible and may very well be incorrect. Feel free to correct me down in the comments down below. While you can see the full list of named river gods by Hesiod on the screen, five of these gods deserve special mention, and those are Achelous, Isophus, Enohos, Nilus, and Scamander. Each of these gods play a special role in the history of Greek mythology. Achelous, the god of the Achelous River, is defeated by Heracles in a wrestling match, after which Heracles is given permission to marry Denaria. Asophus is the father of Aegina, a nymph who was carried off by Zeus. Sisyphus would later share this secret, and it would eventually lead, at least in part, to his legendary punishment. Enohos is a bit of a weird case, as not only is he a river god, but we are also told that he was the first king of Argos. It's a little unclear how accurate this is. Some scholars believe that the river god and the king of Argos are actually two different characters with the same name, while some believe it to be the same character. Nihilus is one of the most interesting river gods, as he represents the Nile River, which is a pretty long way away from Greece. 
We are told that Nihilus' children would go on to form the royal families of Egypt, Libya, Arabia, and Ethiopia. Lastly, but certainly not least, is the river god Scamander. We are told that Scamander fought in the Trojan War, and very nearly drowned the legendary hero Achilles because Achilles filled his river with the corpses of Trojans. I think that's fairly understandable. These river gods are actually extremely fascinating. Despite being gods, most of them are active in mortal affairs, and may have even been the primogenitors to entire royal lines. Sadly, we don't have that much collective information on these river gods, aside from the deeds and names of a select few. The river gods were not the only grouping of children that Oceanus and Tithus would come to have. The second group are the Oceanids. These are again innumerable. Most Oceanids came in the form of spring nymphs, with each typically being some sort of guardian or protector of their individual spring. However, a select few rise to much higher heights. For instance, Medius, Zeus's first wife, mother of Athena, and the personification of intelligence, is an Oceanid. Styx, the personification of the same named river in the underworld, is actually massively important in Greek mythology, as she serves as the guarantor of all oaths sworn to the gods. While still, Europa and Asia, two other Oceanids, seem to represent the two continents as a whole rather than any specific source of water. We also see several Oceanids serve as the wives and consorts of some of the most important gods and titans. Metis married Zeus. Evrenomi also married Zeus. Styx married Pallas, a second generation titan. Perse married Helios, the original god of the sun. And Clyme married Iapetus. I think you get the point. It seems that having an Oceanid as a wife was a very common occurrence in Greek mythology. Oceanids were also routinely the object of prayers and sacrifices by Greek sailors. So yeah, I think you can certainly say that Oceanus and Tithus' children were very important. Now, let's get on to what Oceanus and Tithus did personally during the history of Greek mythology. The first important note is that Oceanus, no matter the source, is always depicted as refusing to take part in the overthrow of Oranos or the war against the gods. In every sense of the word, Oceanus personally is consistently neutral in godly conflicts, and by extension, so was Tethys. Homer and Plato also seem to insinuate, or even flat out state, that it was actually Oceanus and Tethys who are the mother and father of all. This is typically ignored by most historians of Greek mythology, with the version depicting Gia and Oranos being much more widely accepted and believed. Oceanus mostly stays quiet during Cronus's reign. The next mention of Oceanus is during the fight between the Olympian gods and the Titans, where we are told that, despite his own personal neutrality, he either sends, or supports, Styx and her children over to Zeus's side. We are even told in some sources that the Olympian gods send Hera to wait out the war with Oceanus and Tethys, with Tethys becoming a sort of foster mother to Hera in the process. In any case, we know that Oceanus was respected enough for the Olympian gods to not even attempt to punish him along with his siblings, and both Oceanus and Tethys remained free even after the Great War. And really, that's about it. Just as with most Titans, we don't get many individual stories for Oceanus or Tethys. Instead, Oceanus especially is important for what he represents. He is the boundary for Greek civilization. Beyond his river, we start to get into the more fanciful aspects of Greek mythology. Tartarus, the Underworld, the Hespertides and their famous golden apples, the three-headed horse-slash-man Geryon, all of these more unbelievable aspects of myth lie beyond Oceanus and his river. He serves as a boundary line between the realm of man and the realm of mythology. Oceanus and Tethys must also be mentioned for the, comparatively, major impact their children have on the story of Greek myth. Not only do their daughters serve as the consorts and wives of some of the most powerful and important figures in Greek myth, but their sons are the literal embodiment of every river on the face of the earth. That has to count for something, right? I think that just as is the case for most of the pre-Olympian deities, Oceanus and Tethys are more important for what they represent, along with their children, rather than themselves personally. Oceanus is the literal border between mythology and the realm of man, while his and Tethys' sons and daughters would go on to influence the Greek world for generations to come. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. These videos are a little harder for me to make, as we really lack source material, and quite simply, any legends for these deities in particular. Hopefully, I have done a decent enough job to bring you what information we do have in a relatively entertaining way. I also again want to apologize for the delay recently in videos. 
I've been destroyed by this cold, but I hope I'm on the tail end of it and the videos will continue as normal. I also want to note that this is the first video with my new mic. Uh, the settings around the mic may change as we get through these videos, but if you have any feedback on the audio quality, I would love for you to leave that in the comments down below. Also, if you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I made a mistake, please comment down below. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed, it really helps the channel out. Peace.